We start this week with David Moat and Eleanor Kershaw. They're both from AEOB House People. Hi, both of you, and welcome to Dialect. Hi, Tony. Hello, hi, Good Tony. To be here. Uh, starting with you, Eleanor, why did you get involved with this group? I'd been um, peripherally aware that it had started through my friendship with David uh, for a while, um, but for before that, I'd been considering community housing and think it got to a point of thinking, partly out of thinking, um, I appear to have the cat box for my street. And then you start thinking, well, actually, how many things do you need individually as a household? And how many vacuum cleaners are in use on your street all at the same time? Could you reduce how many that you need? And you, once you start thinking like that, you think, actually, what sort of facilities could we share in a much more economical and efficient way? But I know you have an interest also in, if you're building new houses, building them in the right place. That's right. I think um, there's a lot of new houses get built. People want, want something new. They think that that is the best way to get something efficient is to start from scratch and build it in the best possible way. But that uses a lot of extra space. We've got massive demands on land um, in this country for uh, properties. And yet we've got massive amounts of empty commercial buildings sitting there completely empty. You'll see offices to let signs all over the city everywhere you go. Um, and that could be used as housing. Well, you say that, but I've just been through Wiltshire today. You can drive for, for miles and miles and miles and not see a single house. It's just rolling green hills, mostly empty countryside. But there's a lot of questions um, coming up in the news about our food security and the ability of our, um, our country to support itself in terms of farming. And if we put pressure on the countryside to build houses because people want to move further and further out of the city and have these shiny new houses, then that reduces our ability to be a self-supporting uh, country in the long run from other perspectives. But isn't the fact of the matter that people maybe grow up and work in the city, but then as soon as they can afford it, they buy a place in the country? Yeah, that's because the city as it stands is not a nice place for them to live. So that's what should be dealt with, not say, let's move out. Let's say, let's fix the city. Let's make it somewhere we want to live uh, alongside where we work so that we're not having to do this massive, horrible commute every day to where we work and then live somewhere else because it's nice. We yeah. should be able to work and live somewhere nice close together. Yeah. Yeah, and I anecdotally driving around the city, walking around the city, cycling around the city, you see so many, it seems, plots of uh, rubble, you know, with the uh, signboards up outside, the, you know, bits of uh, boarding up around them. Uh, on Temple Way, for example, two perfectly good buildings were demolished there within the last few years. Um, and also lots and lots of empty buildings. So have you any idea how much of the land in Bristol, in you know, within the city is... Uh, could be being used um, but isn't, were either empty or just flattened and demolished land? I think uh, we're getting towards, um, there was uh, around probably one, almost getting on for two million sort of uh, square feet of empty office uh, office buildings. Um, and that's not including the new ones which are, they're trying to sell um, off plan, like the, the one you mentioned down in Temple Way, the, the, the glass, whatever it's called. Glass Wharf, yeah. um, which is, they've got big signs up there saying it's, it's BREAM certificated, so it's one of the best um, sort of top spec for environmental um, attributes. But you turn around from looking at that site, literally turn on your feet in the same place, and you'll see almost every other building on that roundabout has got a significant proportion of it empty. I know, they're quite sneaky, aren't they? I've noticed quite often, if there's only one tenant, they'll put them on the ground floor. So if you're just walking past, you don't notice that the rest of the office block uh, is empty. Uh, also, David, w what brought you into uh, AEOB House People? It's not the easiest, it doesn't trip off the tongue the easiest, but it stands for? Abolish Empty Office Buildings House People. Well, it sounds like a great concept, um, but how are you going to abolish empty office buildings? By demonstrating that ordinary people can get together and create a model housing cooperative out of a uh, an office building uh, reusing it for for residential purposes why, why why are you focused on office buildings then office buildings are noticeable are iconic and because in our economy Offices seem to get built when other places are at a standstill. It is extraordinary that we have, we've had this massive recession, but the developers seem to be able to sit on their assets for years and years or even uh, build new places where, where ordinary people can't afford somewhere to live. So the, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring together people with, with money and good intent 
and people with need and with skills without without the financial means to be able to bring their own dreams to fruition. Well, now something seems to be very wrong because if it was me owning an office building, I wouldn't be able to afford to keep it empty for maybe 10 years. I'd have to have people in there. So how is it that we've got all these office buildings in the city, those that haven't been demolished, that they're empty? We've, um, we've asked this question ourselves as a group and one, one of us has been um, researching it I haven't seen the results of that research yet, but it's something to do with tax breaks. It's something to do with being able to to, to sit on assets. I think there's a phrase used that's land banking. Right. You so you sit you sit on these assets, and they they are assets. In the same, you and I might have money in the bank. The, these are it's a kind of uh, the, the, it's the bank kept in the form of a building. And what what's wrong about it is that it doesn't put people first it doesn't it doesn't give value to the lives of people who need somewhere to live it's not based on need it's based on on power on on, a, on an asset that at some point i suppose it's collateral you know at some point it can be converted into well it's just like money else. in the bank isn't it and the other thing i suppose is that if it's empty you can sell it at the drop of a hat you've got you know it's vacant possession if someone's going to buy an office building off you they don't really want to have to deal with lots and lots of tenants inside it and renegotiate um tenancy agreements or whatever with them if you're going to buy a building you want it empty don't you yeah so what you asked me earlier on how this happened really i was running something called a reconciliation laboratory and it was focused on the divisions in Bristol between rich and poor. And one of the biggest markers is who, who owns a house and who doesn't. Uh, if you're on the, in the property market, I mean, I am, for example. I, I, 20-something years ago, I was able to buy my house for 39500 um, and it's now paid off. I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones. So without much effort, I'm, I'm able to live well on, on very little so are you looking to buy somewhere bigger and expand? No, I'm not, I'm not at all. I'm con- con- content with what I've got. But I, just, I think it's completely wrong that other people who, who are really struggling with very high rents in much poorer quality housing than it, I think that's a, that's a scandal. Well, and maybe, Eleanor, you can tell us about paying rent because this seems to be... I mean, what, what's happened here is David, because he's managed to get on the property ladder early, he's used his, essentially, paying off his mortgage or whatever, his rent to get himself a place at the end of it. But for many people, that's just simply not possible. Yeah. Generation rent, I think Absolutely, they call it. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm 30, and I have uh, really feel like I've seen from the very beginning of my renting days to the point where I am not expecting to be able to buy a property. The first house that I um, lived in was a tiny little sort of back-to-back pokey kind of place, but it was perfect for what we needed at the time. And the house next door to us, when I first moved in there, uh, was on the market for about 18000 And this was up in, in West Yorkshire. Um, and by the time I left there, about 18 months later, a house down the end of the street, exactly the same model, pretty much the same sort of internal condition, went for 31000 So that had nearly doubled in a year and a half. Um, and then... I look at um, the equivalent kind of places around here um, and you're looking at nearly 100,000 just for a two-bedroom flat. Now, it was one of the Conservative councillors in Sirencester last week um, was reported as saying, well, 250,000 to 300,000, that's affordable housing. Well, I think about the amount of mortgage <laughs> that you'd have to have just to be able to buy that when you can only get four times your income um, to... That's that's crazy. It's absolutely crazy amount of money um, for anyone to try and, and get hold of, unless they're lucky enough to have a very rich family who can support them. So, um, I mean, you've obviously, I mean, you've been paying rent for a good while. Yeah. Uh, you've been thinking about this. What what do you think is wrong with the system that's allowed somebody like you to be paying really over the odds for rent for such a long time and still end up with at the end of it with nothing? Everybody is out there to make money. Landlords can charge what they want. Um, with no real um, requirement to make sure it's in, in good condition and the rental level is basically seems to be based on what they can sell you. So it, it's, oh, it's, it's What they can get away with. Exactly, it's two bedrooms, <laughs> therefore it must be at least this much. You, we have the local housing allowance which is supposed to support people on low incomes. Um, well, my house is already at... When I first moved in it was bang on the local housing allowance. Um, after two years of living there, I'm now having to find an extra £50 a month um, out of 
thin air to be able to continue living there. But my, my option is live there or live nowhere because there isn't anywhere else to go to. I can't turn around and say, well, that's all right. I can move to somewhere that's back within my back within my budget because it just isn't there. And unless you have a massive list of severe uh, impediments to getting a normal house, you, there's no point in applying to be on the housing register. Well, I can see why you're part of the residence group or uh, <laughs> AEOB house people. We'll give them another plug. Uh, <laughs> but, but tell us, how does the residence group work? We've got um, a, a collection of people um, from various different backgrounds. Some, like myself, um, we've got... Uh, someone who's currently has been living in a van for a while quite happy living in a van but would actually like sort of a one-bedroom place in the community um we've got people who in various different um situations but all who feel they have a lack of secure housing um whether that's because they're um they're self-employed so they they can't um maintain a, a higher rent or they might need to be able to stop step back to a lower rent uh, at a later point in time um, but what we try and do is use it to explore rather than just saying, right, you know, we'll, we'll write you down on the list and when we get our property, you go in. It's not like that. We use um, these people's experience. Um, we share our experiences to try and work out what are people's needs, to try and tease out the difference between our needs and our wants and what what do we really need individually if we think about it uh, rather than saying, well, this is that we all want to subscribe to this um, sort of social conditioning idea of what we're supposed to want in a house, which for a lot of people just really isn't true. Well, that's a lovely opportunity, if you can, to get involved in designing your own place. But what about living on top of people? People don't always get on, do they? The problem is there are lots of places where you do live on top of each other, high-rise flats or even just sort of apartment blocks, and often they don't work because you're not neighbours. You are fighting with each other. It's always about conflict. It's about who's leaving stuff in the stairwell and things like that. But if you imagine just a, a block of eight, say, maisonettes um, in that situation who share a stairwell, if instead of saying of those people fighting over whose responsibility it was to do this, that and the other or who was leaving things around, those people are actually part of a community. There was, they were their own tenants organisation, their own, their own community cooperative. They have regular meetings that say and they which they all agree to these are things you can put in this place this but, is our, this is our shared always, space my point is that you don't always agree at the meeting you know no. people just don't necessarily always get on do they no they don't and for a lot of people they're thinking well you know do i really want to be part i'd rather, rather have just have my own place and not have to make agreements with neighbors and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but conflict is part of what makes we we need face-to-face conflict to work through conflict to to build community yeah, but for a lot of people uh, for example if they've shared a house conflict is why they don't want to do it anymore but if you can sit down over a cup of coffee and have a half hour shout out about what it is that's causing the problem so everyone understands what's going on you're much more likely to come to a resolution than you are bickering and bitching at each other but back and forth at the door every time you happen to see each other because you've got a forum to air your grievances and you've got pe- other people there who are part of your community who also have a vested interest in the success of it to help you mediate. People have a lot of skills that they don't necessarily realise they have. People find that they are natural mediators and facilitators when it comes to getting people to see each other's point of view, to, to work towards a common but goal. There are a lot of damaged people out there, aren't there, on the housing ladder. They're not always very easy people to reason with. Yeah, that's true. And one of the things we've identified is as a, a community-building need, uh, as part of what we want to do, is to give access to skills um, for people who are um, maybe coming into the, the cooperative who have no background in it, or for the group in general, that if we, if we and they feel it would be beneficial to, for example, run a workshop to help people. There are other people, yes, there are examples of um, housing communities which haven't worked, but there are also examples of housing communities that have, that really have and really thrived, and we can learn from them. And conversely, we're... Uh, moving forward if we can get it to really work here we want to share what we've learnt to let other people do it again somewhere else and we'd be happy we're working towards putting together sort of materials and potentially sort of workshops we'd be happy to go and say well yeah this is how we did it here's some ideas to help help people get started well, elsewhere. No, this is not all hot air because you've got over a hundred thousand pounds committed to uh, and you, you've put an offer on a building we've actually got virtually two hundred thousand in the bank this is through a community share offer because our idea is that there are people with money out there who can be part of the solution, who who feel a concern. Uh, in, well, take, take me as an example. You know, I, I've put in, a, I've bought in a bought a few a few shares, about three grand's worth of shares in this, 
and uh, I think it's it's a good thing. I think there are creative people with with a bit of money out there who can meet midway people with need but with the skills to do a bit of building work to create community to do other things well they say safe as houses i hope your money is safe as houses do you think it is safe well i think i think so there's there's no you know there's no nothing in life is completely risk-free no northern rock tells us that doesn't yeah, it? yes i mean i you know i had a, i had an endowment mortgage the, the whole endowment scheme was was oversold we've had um the, the, the uh, protection, you know, for card protection. Payment protection. That was payment insurance, protection yeah. insurance. I was oversold. I had a, a equitable life. I, I was persuaded by oh. my family to put money in an equitable life, you know, pension. And that was mismanaged, cooperative bank. Now, there's, there's no safety out there. But, I, but I, I, I choose to put my money in something I believe in that is a registered cooperative that is managed by people I respect that I can see face to face. Uh, that is going to be put to good use, and through many dozens of people, we've raised two hundred thousand. We need one hundred thousand more to complete on the purchase of a place which we've identified. I won't reveal where it is, you know, because someone else could could come in there and and snatch it off us. But we've had Gazum- a, we've had Gazum- an offer, Gazum- us. <laughs> but we've had an offer accepted on a place that is um, is or has been very recently an office building. That is very suitable for, for conversion to uh, a residence. But David, people also want to return on their money, don't they? On their investment, they expect a little bit back uh, in interest from the bank. Yes, we're we're not a, we're not running a charitable model. We're running we're offering three percent return on the investment, and in a thirty year period, which is the financial model we, we've drawn up. We've shown a, a, a break-even situation with, with that that three percent return. Come on, let's talk about the Wonga. How much do you get back for your investment? Three percent on what you've invested. Okay, Eleanor, give us a, a reason why people should uh, put a bit of money into this. We talked about investment. Lots of people invest in different ways. People who've got money, they don't want it to just sit there. And there's a difference between um, going down to the bank and saying, "I want an investment," and the people who are taking that money off you, they're interested in making profit from themselves. Well, and, maybe, and, maybe and, and maybe making profit for you, for you but not, <coughs> they're not necessarily... It doesn't bother them if The highest fails. profits come from drug dealing and, uh, and arms dealing, don't they? And whilst HSBC actually were dealing with the um, um, uh, money launderers and drug cartels in Mexico. Yeah. Mm. So you, I'm hoping that you're going to guarantee you're not using the money to invest in those kind of things well we're um currently registered as a cooperative we've been moved to a community benefit society but again it's it's registered uh, uses the same cooperative rules they're regulated by the financial conduct authority and they the community share offer is is recognized and regulated by them so we have to have in order to be that organization we have to have a very strict set of rules by which we run the society which are publicly available and we are accountable entirely to our members. So if people are convinced they're interested in investing a little bit in your concern, getting some of these old office buildings converted to people to live in, uh, where can they go? How can they do it? We have a website um, which is um, www.aeobhousepeople, all one word, .org.uk. Um, on there, you'll see um, all the information, the, the details and statistics that back up what we've been, been talking about today um, and opportunities to invest. There's also uh, links to, to guidance, independent guidance on investing in community shares from the cooperatives, UK organisations. So we don't want anyone to jump into it just because we've said it's great. We want people to do it in an informed and sensible way. And what about if people are looking for somewhere to live as well? Because, I mean, we've got something like 15,000 out there in Bristol on the yeah, housing. absolutely. We've got the... Uh, on, again, on the website there, there's the prospective residence group. I'm the key contact for the for the prospective residents, and we currently meet about every four weeks. Um, so anyone who wants to get in touch, um, who wants to know more about what we're doing, I'd be more than happy to, to talk to them about that. Fantastic. Well, Eleanor Kershaw and David Mowat, thanks very much for joining us on Dialect. Thank, Thank you. you. You're listening to dialectradio.co.uk. Okay, okay, okay.